Awesome. Thanks all. Welcome to um, today's webinar. Sharon, I'll just get you to jump on mute if that's okay, just while we kick things off today and then I'll throw to you in a minute. Um, today's webinar, upcoming federal election, how to ask the tough questions. Um, I just want to kick things off by first acknowledging that I'm on Gadigal country uh, here in the Eora Nation in Sydney and I pay my respects to um, Aboriginal people and their elders past and present. If you want to jump in the chat and say where you're from, what station you're from, what country you're on, that'd be great. Thank you to everyone who's already said hi um, and for those that are joining us on the Facebook as well. So I'll kick things off really quickly as your host today before throwing to our um, phenomenal speakers, Sharon and Amanda. Um, just a bit of an overview of what we'll go through today. So I guess in regards to a bit of a scene setting, I know so many community radio stations do amazing jobs at engaging politicians, uh, whether that's for interviews or at events or inviting politicians to come to new studios or these sorts of things. So there's already so much amazing political engagement that happens in the sector. Um, but we thought with the upcoming federal election, it would be a good opportunity to really dig deep and see where we could help you and your skill set um, to further increase the impact of what you do for your communities. So where we sort of got to when formulating this webinar was, how do we have interviews where we get the information that our communities really need? And it's not about putting anyone offside or being bipartisan or anything like this. It's just about making sure that when you're asking questions of people, you're really digging down to get to the truth and therefore your communities can make informed decisions during an election and afterwards. So that's really what we're gonna, we're gonna tackle today. And I'll throw to Sharon in a minute to go through some tips to help you um, ask sort of critical interview questions. And we'll also throw to Amanda Kopp um, to look at the current political climate in Canberra and some tips from what she's learned at her time uh, reporting the press gallery. And then I'll use an opportunity right at the end just to talk about what the CBAA's uh, major campaign ask is for the federal election to support community radio and how you can sort of weave that into your interviews as well. And of course, you have an opportunity to ask questions. So we'll probably run for about 30 minutes uh, with content, 30 minutes for questions. So of course, if you've got questions, drop them in the chat line um, and we will take it from there. Um, so our guest today, we've got Amanda Cox, CWA's political reporter. She reports for the National Radio News, which goes out to about 115 stations across the country, um, as well as The Wire from time to time, which is the national flagship um, program, current affairs program. Um, and we've got Sharon Davis, who's an award-winning winning journalist. So very excited to have you both here today. Um, oh yes, and myself, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Holly Freeland, I'm the head of advocacy and communications at the CBAA. Um, so I'm responsible for making sure that government understands why community radio is important and therefore funding us um, well and making sure our regulation and legislation is effective for our stations. So I uh, work a lot with government, but also with stations to help stations understand um, their rules and requirements as well. So you can always drop me a line anytime if you've got questions. So Sharon, I will throw things over to you if that's okay. Thanks Holly. Hi everyone. Uh, great that you've joined us today and thanks for being here and feel free to ask us any questions at the end of this and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them I'm sure. Holly has asked me to talk a little bit about um, political interviewing which in many ways isn't so different from any kind of interviewing really. It's basically, um, you know, you need to know a bit about your topic and you need to have done your research and, um, and you need to have some sort of focus. Now that's the kind of stuff that you need to have for every interview and I'll go through those in a bit more stages in a minute about how you go about doing that. The difference, I suppose, with politicians is that they're quite practised at evading answers. That's, they do lots of media courses um, and they learn how not to answer questions. And they also learn all the tricks about um, how to make an interview kind of lose track of where they are and, and what their intention is. One of those is flattery. Politicians are very good at flattering you, particularly if they think it's going to give them a good interview. So 
that's not really what you want to do. What you want to do is kind of before you go out and talk to a politician or normally with a politician, you're going to be going through their media advisor to actually, um, you know, request an interview with the politician. Before you do that, you need to have sat down and actually thought through what your intention of the interview is. That is, what is your focus? What do you want from this interview? And importantly, what does your audience want from the interview? What are they expecting as well? So they're the kind of questions that you'll be asking yourself before you do the interview. It's also really important to think about what kind of interview this is and to actually brief the media advisor or the politician on what kind of interview it is. Is it a short three minute interview for your current affairs slot? Is it a longer interview? Is it a longer, more um, exploratory interview for um, a longer current affairs piece? Is it a feature piece? You need to actually let the media advisor or the politician know that because then they know how they're going to respond with their answers and whether they're short or long answers or, or whether they, uh, you know, you also need to, they'll often ask you if it's an edited interview, you need to let them know that it's going to be edited before it goes to air. Sometimes you might be talking to them live on air. Um, there's quite a lot of politicians now that like to do live interviews because they like not to be edited. So, you know, all of those things are important to think about when you're actually requesting the interview. Um, but the, the most important thing that you need from this interview is a focus. So, you know, politicians cover a huge range of areas. Um, if you're doing uh, uh, an interview with the communications minister about community radio, community radio is a very broad field. You need to know what specifically you want from this interview, what area of community radio you'll be talking to them about. You may be talking to them about funding in the next federal election. You need to kind of hone in on that. And, and the way that you do that is to actually do some research. You need to know your topic. The really important thing about good interviews is good interviewers are confident with their material. They've done their research. They know the questions that they're going to ask. They know a bit of background about both the politician and, and about, um, say, government policy around that particular area so that they can respond to what's actually happening in the interview and not have these vague general questions that, you know, are kind of like allow the politicians to make motherhood statements. That's not the kind of interview that you want, really. You want to really you know, focused interview where you've sat down beforehand and thought through your questions, written them down perhaps, although, you know, you don't want to um, sort of do rote questioning either with your list in front of you where you're reading it off. Um, uh, what do I do to research a topic if I'm going to do an interview with a politician? Well, I might have some general knowledge about the topic. So, you know, the great thing now is we have Google as this incredible research tool where we can get very quick information very quickly. If I'm interviewing a politician, a specific politician, I'll also be looking at what they've already said on the thing, whether they've issued any policy statements on that. And I'll go through those and look at the, what, what is their particular party's record on this particular issue? is another thing that you wanna know before you're interviewing them. And then I'll sit down and work out what the intention of my interview is and write out an interview. I'll actually think about the interview, how it might start, how it might end, how I'm going to approach the interview through it. But then I'll kind of use those questions as a sort of a guide, really. I won't stick with those questions necessarily, but it will make me go into the interview very confidently knowing what I want to ask. And, and then I'll often sit down and turn um, those kind of focused questions into dot points to take with me to the interview so that I can kind of look at them during the interview and reassure myself that I've covered all the areas that I want to cover. But you know, the other critical thing about a good interview 
is that it's an interview where you listen as the interviewer, you listen to what's being said and pick up on things, pick up on points that are being made. Um, before the interview, ensure all your equipment's working. You know, I mean, that sounds like a motherhood statement, I know, but I think we've all been in a situation where we've gone to interview somebody in a position of power and the gear isn't working. And there's no greater way to lose confidence before an interview and make yourself look silly than to have gear that doesn't work. So that's kind of like number one, do it. And, you know, it's Murphy's law that the day that you don't do it is the day that it um, breaks down. So that's the thing. Do your research so that you're confident about the material. Um, now, if you're going through a media advisor, they're probably going to ask you for a list of questions. Don't send them. They always do that. And they particularly do it with rookies because they think that, you know, they can get away with it. Um, it is kind of reasonable, though, for them to ask you the subject area and for you to brief them on what subject area you're going to do. If you think about politicians, they have huge portfolios. So it's kind of important to know, for them to know, what subject area you'll be honing in on. So I generally, when I'm asked by a media representative for a list of questions, I don't say I won't send you a list of questions. I usually just send them um, a thing saying, these are the areas that we'll be covering in the interview but I never give them the questions. Please don't do that. The first thing that they do is practice rote answers and it's the most boring interview ever. Um, also resist, this is really important. If the interview is going to be pre-recorded, resist any demands for the interview to be vetoed before it goes to air. Um, that's just, that's not the way journalism works. We don't make agreements about other people listening to uh, uh, deciding what can go on air and what can't, you journalists. Um, always confirm your arrangements. Brief them on what, as I said earlier, brief them on what kind of program it is and be on time. It's really important to be on time. Um, you want them to respect you as you will treat them with respect. So it's really important to kind of, um, to, to be on time, to be in control. And all of these things, kind of research and knowing the topic, that adds to control. Now, it's really important in interviews with politicians to be respectful. Um, you can ask hard questions without uh, being disrespectful. Uh, it's more about knowing what you're going to ask and, and making them focus on the topic. Now, how do you do that as well? Well, there's a few things. One is um, you kind of double barrel questions are a really bad idea, okay? You ask very simple, direct questions. And you might use key words like, can you briefly tell me um, as well, particularly if they're inclined to ramble on. But the, the other thing is that you know, if you say, for instance, and you'll see this all the time if you listen to or watch interviews on television, if you ask a dub, what's called a double barrel question where there's more than one question in the thing, like what did you have for breakfast this morning? Tell me uh, how did it taste? What they'll do is pick up the part of the question that they don't mind answering. So simple questions, one question at a time. Um, if they're not answering the question, it's fine for you as a journalist to say you didn't answer the question just again and put the question again, you know, but be polite about it. Don't be rude or angry about it. Just say, um, sorry, Minister, but, you know, uh, I don't think you answered that question. Could you tell me briefly, blah, blah, blah. Um, Maintain eye contact, listen and watch carefully how they're responding to your questions. Um, listen for moments when the interview sounds rehearsed, vague or repetitious, 
and kind of get them back on topic. They're not there to make policy statements, right? They're there to actually respond to questions. So don't, don't let them veer off into these long rambling policy statement answers. Because you, I mean, you have to maintain the interest of your audience as well. Your, your interview is for a purpose. Um, ask lots of open-ended questions, you know, rather than closed questions where they can say yes or no, unless you're doing a very specific investigative program where you want yes or no answers, then make your questions open-ended. Um, if you don't understand their answer, ask for clarification. You know, don't let them get away with an answer that's kind of gobbledygook, political speak, you know. Um, don't allow generalities. Say things like things in interviews like, what do you mean by that? They're really good questions. How would you do that? How would you put that into practice? That sort of stuff. They're really, they're very short, very simple, but very good questions. Um, and end the interview by setting the stage for your return. Um, you know, if, if I have more to ask you, could I come back to you? Like, just, um, just end it well, you know, don't burn your bridges before you walk out because you probably want to go back again. And um, Amanda will tell you that, you know, spending time in Canberra, you don't want to burn your bridges. You want to be able to go back in the next time and have them, you know, agree to you doing the interview. Um, I haven't looked at any of these comments yet because I've been talking my head off. Um, maybe I can just go to Amanda now. Do you think that's a good... Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, I'll just jump in for a hot minute because we've had so many amazing questions come through. So thanks so much, everyone. I will um, throw to you both in a minute to go through some of these questions. Um, I've just been asked if I can read um, the key points on the slide. Um, so just to recap the key points from this side, it's called political interviewing. And the key points are focus and intention, confidence, research, ask neutral open-ended questions and ask for specifics. Um, so there's some of the key points and we'll also be sending out a pack at the end of this with a lot of the detail that Sharon spoke to. But thank you so much, Sharon. If you wanna just jump on mute and I'll throw to Amanda now, and then um, we'll turn to questions in a minute. I can just move my slide. Oh, oh not that far. There we go, tips from Canberra, Amanda Cop. Fabulous. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, hopefully you can take away uh, some good tips to help improve your interviewing um, and getting some pollies on your shows. Um, so I'm going to talk through um, a couple of things today, uh, just talking about confidence um, and how important that is, particularly when talking to politicians and their offices. Um, what politicians think of community radio stations from my experience here in Canberra, um, working with media advisors, which Sharon has also touched on, um, and what opportunities are coming up for stations with the upcoming election. Um, so a bit about me, um, Holly already said, but I work in the Canberra Press Gallery, so I'm sitting here in Parliament House at the moment. Um, I do all of the political content for National Radio News uh, and and occasionally The Wire. I also run a political podcast which, which goes out on the community radio network called Bubble Pop. So if you're interested in any uh, political kind of wrap-up shows, um, tune in. Um, so first I'm going to go into what politicians think of community radio. So I originally um, came into Canberra working for SBS and then switched over to community radio. And I guess um, going from a national broadcaster to um, to community radio, and I was, I was kind of maybe not concerned, but uh, curious about how politicians would react to that in terms of how much time they would have for me and for the sector. Um, but to be honest, I have actually been pretty pleasantly surprised by the response from most politicians here in Canberra. Um, as always, it's a bit of a struggle to get, you know, ministers um, to talk to you, but um, just because of their time kind of allocations, but um, everyone else has been amazing. Um, so I think 
in terms of what that can mean for you, I think sometimes it can be easy to think as a community radio station that like, oh, they don't have time for us or, oh, you know, we're, we're just small. But really, I think that it's better to look at the advantages that community radio has and the fact that politicians actually do value community radio. They understand that, you know, we have close ties with our communities. We know what's going on on the ground from a grassroots perspective, which a lot of the other national broadcasters don't really have. Um, and I guess in terms of the politicians that you can target, you know, you're not necessarily going to get the prime minister on your show, but you know, always worth a shot. Um, but uh, independents are really, really good. The Greens love us. Um, even Pauline Hanson, um, she has a soft spot for community radio um, in terms of, you know, having that kind of grassroots um, interaction with communities. Um, and, you know, in some ways you can kind of think that independents are, are a bit smaller fries, but um they have a lot of sway in in a lot of uh, big policy decisions, so they are really valuable to be able to get on on your shows. Um, and I guess with the major parties, again, um, use your community to to your advantage. Uh, you know, call not necessarily some random person in another state, um, but you know, talk to your local member. Um, or you know, if your if your radio station goes across several electorates, you know, get good relationships with them. Um, so. Yeah, I think overall in terms of the impression that people have of community radio stations, um, it's good and bad. I think um, good in the sense that uh, politicians are very aware that the media sector is shrinking. And I think that we're in a space where there are fewer and fewer stations and TVs and newspapers in particularly regional areas, but also just locally. And so I think that a lot of politicians actually see the value in community radio stations. And that is something that you should use to your advantage. Um, the bad, I think, you know, sometimes they think that, you know, maybe our audiences are a bit small um, or, you know, maybe they're not getting a national coverage. Um, but again, that can also be to your advantage in terms of being hyper-local um, and that they're actually speaking to the people in in their electorates. Plus, you know, if you are working on a program that does go national, say that. Um, say that, you know, you have an, a, a national coverage. Coverage. Um, so I guess that kind of segues nicely into how to get politicians to talk to you. Um, it can be a struggle. Um, and I think that number one is to understand, understand and accept rejection, uh, but to not let that dissuade you um, and to try again. Um, I think the thing to understand is that politicians are incredibly busy people. Um, they don't always have a lot of time. Um, so I think in terms of a tip to, um, or some tips to, to get them to talk to you is just give them lots of warning. Um, you know, instead of kind of calling up on the day, although I know, you know, sometimes that kind of just has to be the case because of breaking news, but, you know, where you can um, give them lots of warning. So, you know, you call them up at the beginning of the week, say, hey, we're doing something on this, you know, later in the week. Do you have any time that you can talk to me in the next three days or something like that? And they're, they're much more likely to say, oh, okay, cool. Like, you know, yeah, of course we can, we can fit you in. Um, I think, like I was saying before, confidence is key. I think that, you know, if you call up and are kind of like, oh, you know, we're this little station and we'd love to talk to you maybe if you have time, you know, that's not very convincing um, in terms of uh, them giving you their valuable time. So I think when you are talking to um, politicians, but, you know, most likely you're probably going to be talking to their media advisors, um, just, you know, use, use those things that are advantageous to you. So the fact that we are local, if you're talking to your local politician, you know, say that, you are talking directly to the people who are voting for you. Um, and I think the other thing as well is that you can kind of, if you are getting the sense that um, that maybe they're not wanting to speak to you or they don't have time, um, you know, use that, use that line, you know, say our audiences who are voting for you or not, um, you know, would really like to hear from you, that, that kind of thing. Um, and I think the other reason, the other thing is, is to actually just give them a reason to talk to you. So that local community stuff, but, you know, you can talk about your audience. Um, you know, if you're speaking on a particular issue um, or your station has a particular kind of audience and that's actually what you want to be talking to them about, say that, you know, if it's, if it's a religious community, um, you know, a kind of like more progressive community, um, you know, say those sorts of things in terms of why they should be interested in, in talking to you. The other thing as well is that sometimes, um, you know, we kind of want to get the biggest politician. We want to get the kind of minister or the shadow minister. Um, and sometimes they don't have time. 
Um, the other thing to remember is that there are lots of other opportunities with, with different politicians. You can look at backbenchers who often have a personal interest um, or, you know, potentially in their life before politics had an interest in the topics that you might be discussing. Um, there's assistant ministers for each portfolio. So, you know, if you can't get the health minister, get the assistant health minister or, you know, the minister for aged care or something like that, something, you know, that's kind of slightly lower down the rungs. Um, there's also the other thing that I have found really helpful is politicians who uh, are on particular committees. So there's all kinds of committees, parliamentary committees, which you can um, you can find information on that on the Australian Parliament House website, aph.gov.au. Um, and each committee, so there's like a health committee, an education committee, a national security committee, like committees on literally everything, um, that they have a, uh, a kind of leadership team. And that will usually have someone from the Liberals, from Labor, or sorry, from the Coalition, I should say, um, from Labor and usually someone from the crossbench. Um, so, you know, if you want to be talking about, say, education policy, you can't get the education minister. Talk to the person who is the chair of the education committee, um, you know, because they will have that kind of thing um, uh, to be able to talk about it. Um, and yes, like I said, uh, try, try again. Um, often politicians, if they do, if they don't have time for you, they can... Um, you know, use again, use that to your advantage. Say, hey, you know, you didn't you, you didn't have time for us last time. Like, you know, what about this time? You know, make them feel guilty, <laughs> essentially. Um, or, you know, if you're kind of on the phone to them and they're like, oh, look, you know, we don't have time for for this week, then say, OK, cool. Well, you know, like we could probably run this next week or, you know, oh, there's something else coming up in, you know, two weeks time. Like, can we lock in a time for, for then? Right. You know, just keep keep pushing it. Um, and I guess the thing with media advisors, Sharon kind of touched on this, but those are people that, that you're primarily going to be dealing with. Um, I think number one, don't waste their time. They're also very busy people. Get to the point. Um, and I think the thing that they're always looking for is how is that interview going to advantage their, their, their boss, essentially. Um, and it's not that you have to kind of sit there and be like, well, you know, we want to provide a little platform for them to talk about whatever thing they're interested in. Um, but I think it's more about saying, you know, our community is really inter interested in this particular space, um, you know, or if it's their local electorate, you know, give them a reason to, to talk to you. The other thing as well is that um, media advisors, while being quite busy people, they're, they're still reasonable. Um, I think sometimes I have found with topics that are a little bit spiky, um, you know, people who maybe it's a bit of an awkward topic or there's kind of divisions in the party um, is just be honest with them, really. Um, you know, you can say, look, I know that this is a difficult topic for ex-politician. Um, you know, we're not and again, you know, depends on whether that's actually your aim or not. But, um, you know, you, you, you can say, look, this is the kind of my line of questioning. Don't necessarily give them every single question, but, you know, give them confidence that you're not kind of tricking the politician into talking them talking to you um, and then kind of throwing them under the bus, um, which, you know, you can do if you want. <laughs> but I think it's more just about being honest um, and, and keeping those connections and not and not burning, um, not burning bridges. Um, so I guess just quickly with the upcoming election, um, this is a huge possibility and a massive wealth of stories. Um, so see it as, as a huge opportunity and start thinking about how you're going to be doing the coverage in the lead up to the election now, because I mean, at the moment, we're thinking that it's going to be in March, um, but you know, it could kind of be any time from now really um so start thinking about that now um there's a huge potential for you to get politicians in that they kind of ramp up their media coverage they're super interested in talking to their local community again a great advantage for community radios and there's tons of stories around um so number one get to know your local politician look them up see who they are um again on the aph the australian parliament house website there's a list of all of the things that they do and the portfolios that they're in so you know have a look at the at the issues that they're interested in and you know take that into consideration when you're when you're calling them um uh, and also the other thing as well is if you're forming these relationships potentially for the first time um if you can do it during an election campaign, amazing. Um, and then and then keep that that communication going into into the future. Um, on the flip side, uh, if your local politician isn't super relevant to a lot of the kind of issues that you want to be talking about, um, you know, I, I yeah, I I think you can kind of flip it on the other on the other side and say, um, you know, say if you want to talk to 
Angus Taylor, right? The, the, the energy minister. You can, if you're in a, in an electorate that has, um, you know, a big mining um, town or, you know, that their portfolio specifically relates to your area. Um, that's another way that you can try and convince kind of those bigger politicians to come and um, to come and talk to you. Um, and I guess just really quickly on the big issues to probably keep an eye out is um, climate is going to be huge this election with COP26 coming up. That's going to be all the rage going on from that. It's going to be jobs um, and industries that are going to be impacted by those climate policies. Um, religious freedom is going to be a pretty big one. There's the potential that they're going to try and pass that before the election, but We've only got a handful of sitting weeks left, so not sure whether that's going to happen. Um, and then, of course, economic recovery from COVID um, and just those kind of COVID flow on effects. So, you know, we're talking hospitals, local health funding, mental health um, and what happens with education. So keep all of those things in mind um, in the next couple of months in the lead up to the election. And yeah, just see it as a huge opportunity for you to make those connections with with your local politicians. Thank you so much, Amanda. That's phenomenal advice. And just to recap, um, the text on this slide is tips from Canberra. Confidence, what do politicians think about community radio and working with media advisors? And Amanda made a really good point in regards to sort of selling your value proposition to your media advisors and your politicians. And of course, you can do that verbally, but um, I've also worked with Amanda to help her out in Canberra by putting a little fact sheet together of the number of listeners that listen to national radio news, the type of people that listen, uh, where where they listen. So obviously for your community, if you have data, either through the CWA's um, Community Radio Listener Survey or if any of our other services, you can use that listener data. They love to know how many people are listening. If you don't have that data, that's cool too. Then maybe it becomes more of a profile. We know that most of our listeners are 65 plus and they care about X, Y, and Z things. But just putting a really short half page, if that fact sheet together can also really help you um, when trying to secure an interview with a media advisor. Thanks, Amanda. I'll just ask you to jump on mute, please. And I'll turn to sort of the CWA's election ask for community radio before we run into your amazing questions. So essentially, you as stations are our biggest champions to help us secure more funding for community radio. What I find doing my job is that the MPs and senators and ministers who are our biggest supporters have the most phenomenal connections with their local stations. So for example, um, the previous Minister for Regional Communications, Minister Coulton, he's got the electorate of Park in New South Wales, he's got 13 community radio stations in it, it's probably one of the biggest electorates. And he's on at least three of his stations for interviews every other week. And so he was a phenomenal supporter of ours and very deeply understood the value of community radio. So that's why it's important for me to help empower you to be able to um, connect with your local MPs because it does help our sector. The other part of that is, of course, you have somebody in a hotspot where you can ask them questions. Um, so they're there seeing the value of what you do as you do it and you have the opportunity to ask them what they're doing for community radio. So the points on this slide, um, election and community radio. So stations have done amazing work through COVID-19 and bushfires. That's the first point in the, in the sense that we have such strong support at the moment politically because our, our politicians can really deeply see what you've done through bushfires and through COVID, connecting people, providing health messages and languages other than English, emergency broadcasts in 80 regions across the country through Black Summer, um, connecting people who are most isolated through COVID, providing opportunities to still remain engaged with news. Our, our politicians have a really strong understanding of what we can do now. So our aim and our second dot point is that we are aiming for a federal government investment of $25 million for the sector per annum. So the sector currently receives $20 million per annum. That's the next dot point. And as many of you may know, that goes to the Community Broadcasting Foundation and then the Community Broadcasting Foundation um, disseminates that through peer assessed grants to stations, um, sector bodies like the CBAA for sector wide projects and other sector bodies as well like First Nations Media Australia. $20 million between 450 stations does not go a very long way. And that money hasn't really been topped up for stations for a good decade. 
and but our sector has grown significantly and obviously with more money we can provide more impact so what we're asking is for an additional five million dollars to that pool so for a total of 25 million dollars a year and for me it's really about showcasing to politicians why you know if you are, feel comfortable to ask somebody during an interview hey what are you or your party doing for community radio in this federal election and they say whatever they may say and you say well this the sector is seeking 25 million dollars because for us that money we get from the cbf means that we can do more outside broadcasts we can hire a journalist we can upgrade our aging broadcast infrastructure so we can better report during natural disasters. Whatever it might be that's specific to your station and your community, talk about that value. And again, that's that value proposition. Um, and this last point is really about impact. Make it station and community specific. So during COVID, we lost all of our sponsorship revenue, but we pivoted to set up a new online training program. And with an extra bit of money through the CBF, we could extend that to say talking to more young people, um, whatever it might be. Because at the end of the day, politicians want their communities to thrive and community radio stations help their communities thrive. So I will send all of this information out in a pack at the end of today. So some information about the CBWA's ask and how you can ask about it if you're doing um, an interview with a politician or a contesting politician. And of course, some tips from Sharon and Amanda as well. Ooh. All right, question time. We have so many great questions. So the first one I'll throw to both of you. We've got a few questions around sort of balance and nonpartisanship. Andy Colvin from Two Bob asks, is it always necessary to try for balance? Um, look, I think as a journalist, you should, particularly if you're, you know, if you're serving your particular community, um, then I actually think it's really important. I mean, I know that it was interesting, Amanda, saying that the Greens favour community radio, and that's true. But I actually think in terms of your audience and serving the audience properly, I think you should actually be looking across the political spectrum to be interviewing all of the politicians in your area that service your community that may be, um, you know, have something really important to either offer or tell your community about or to be challenged about in terms of areas in your community that they may actually be ignoring, that are, they're underfunding, for instance, like community radio, but there's plenty of areas. I mean, I actually think that, um, I think that time leading up to elections is a classic time for politicians to actually want to come onto community radio because they know that they can directly speak to the people in their area that are going to make the decision on voting day. So it's prob there's probably never a better time to try and get politicians across the political spectrum onto your radio station. And I would be trying with all of them uh, so I actually do think that balance is important. Um, I, I think it's, it's great that there are particular political parties that understand the nature of community radio and the importance of it, but they're not the ones that fund community radio by and large. So we need to kind of extend the knowledge of, of the way that community radio engages with the community um, in particular areas across the board. Yeah, agree with absolutely all of that. Um, yeah, I think particularly in the lead up to an election, um, I know that different community radio stations often have kind of a different political bent sometimes, um, but it is incredibly important to have all the political voices, particularly in your local areas, um, on your stations in the lead up to an election, um, not just in terms of, you know, it being good having a politician on, um, but in the interests of democracy um, and in terms of, you know, what journalism does and what the media does um, in, in, that, in that sense. Um, so, you know, to, to inform your community 
communities about what options they have available to them when it comes to different policy areas. So, yeah, I guess that um, in my talk, I kind of talked about getting your local politician on. But the other thing to never forget is that there are a whole lot of politicians who just aren't in office. Um, so, you know, talking to, um, you know, if you've got a Labour politician, talking to your coalition member, talking to various independents, um, people from minor parties, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that is definitely something to keep in mind. And yeah, I think look, it, it, it depends on it depends on your show, honestly, um, in terms of the balance. But I think that in general it is uh paramount that you put both sides, um, particularly when you're talking to politicians, because they uh will always have a particular political bent and a particular aim when it comes to speaking on your programs um and you know even if it's not necessarily them who are you know giving the opposing side you know in your questions i think it's always good to say well you know you your policy is this but you know the the concerns are x y and z um and seeing how they respond to that so yeah i definitely think that that is important it's also i, I just might add um, really good to say when you're asking for these interviews, look, we've heard from the Greens candidate and, you know, X candidate, we'd really like to hear from your candidate as well. So that they, they know that you're actually trying to balance up the equation a bit. Doesn't yeah, necessarily have to happen in one interview, but across time, um, that's a good thing to do, I think. And that's also just a really, just really quickly, that's um, a very strategic way of, you know, if someone kind of, you're trying to get someone across the line to speak to you, be like, well, you know, we've already talked to your, to the, to the opposition or, you know, we've already talked to your opponents. Um, you know, we would really like to give you the opportunity to have your say. Um, so yeah, I think that that's a really strategic way to actually get them on the show in the first place. Thank you both. And, and just my only comment on that is, you know, we also have a requirement to offer fair and equal access to political parties contesting the election in your area. So it doesn't mean if you can't secure everyone, you're going to get in trouble, but you can't not. If you've asked somebody one party on or one party contesting the election, you can't sort of decline somebody else. So that's something really important to keep in mind in regards to the election as well. All right, Sharon, I'm going to throw this one to you. We've got about uh, 15 minutes so it would be great to get through a couple more. Um, Frederick from a live radio 905 here in Sydney asks, how do you ask without offending a speaker? I assume um, that might be if it's a bit of a tough question or a tricky one. How do you ask without offending a speaker? Um, I think you could, you can use words like with respect minister um, as well. Uh, as I said, you, a hard interview, a challenging interview doesn't have to be aggressive. You can ask really tough questions in a very calm way. You don't have to get kind of agitated. Um, and also, I think I think really direct questions like, um, "Could you clarify this further?" or you know, things that are sort of very polite, but they're they're kind of to the point. Um, I I think that um, you don't want to be in a situation in an interview where you're engaged in debate. What you want to do is have very clear sort of idea of where the interview is going to go and, and a very clear knowledge of the research that you've done and the factual nature of that research. And you put that in the nicest possible way with a smile, always smile. Always with a smile. I love that. Um, Amanda, I'll check the next one to you. We've got uh, Elizabeth from RTRFM in Perth. I feel like you might um, have this issue from time to time. How do you manage MPs who consistently refuse interviews? Um, yes, well, I think that goes to my point of saying that um, sometimes you just got to take it on the chin and accept that that is a reality of um, asking for interviews sometimes. Um, yeah, it's it's difficult. I think I think it's you, you probably have to reflect on how you're asking for the interview um you know are you giving them enough of a reason um for giving you their time um i think also as well depending on you know what kind of position they're in that usually determines how much time they have um for smaller stations um the other thing as well is 
you can just ask, um, you know, the next time you're on the phone, say, Hey, look, like we've tried to get the, this person on the phone and, you know, don't be rude, but like, you know, you're asking a legitimate question So you know, we've, we've tried to get this politician on, um, you know, multiple times. Um, we don't really seem to be getting any headway. You guys don't really have time. Don't seem to have time for us. Is there a way we can sort that out? Or, you know, just wondering if there's, you know, something going on here that, I'm not aware of, you know, maybe they had a bad experience previously. Um, maybe they, you know, don't think that it's worth their time. Um, and then address those concerns, say, you know, okay, well, maybe we've got, um, you know, a different presenter or a different um, management or, or something like that. Or, you know, say, oh, okay, well, we've talked to the person who you talked to before and, you know, that won't happen again or, or you know, that sort of thing. Um, of course, only if if the offence is, le is legitimate. Um, sometimes politicians can just be a bit too sensitive and <laughs> and that's just you know they've just got to suck it up um but yeah I think I think just ask really um and then see if you can sort it out you know maybe it's you know giving them enough warning um or maybe they don't understand um you know that that you're a local station and that it's important that they talk to their local community that sort of thing um that yeah that would be my recommendation thanks Amanda um, Neil Lithgow from 2RDJ FM nearby here, Burwood, Sydney. Um, he has asked, we also have New South Wales local and state elections coming up. Are there any subtle differences in the approach to state or council representatives? Either or of you? I don't think so. I mean, all of them are answerable to the communities that they're serving. And so I don't think that there should be a difference, really. I mean, when you're talking about uh, local councillors, bear in mind that they're not as media practised um, and that they might actually be um, a little bit nervous, you know, and that's fine because we're all nervous when we're doing interviews with people. And so I guess in that sense, I would be, I, I still think you've got to ask the tough questions. I think it's really important. But just be a little bit gentler about your approach, I think. I mean, as I say, there's sort of federal and state politicians, they're doing media courses every day, every couple of days, you know, about how not to answer questions. Whereas you, your local representatives and, you know, they're usually kind of running their own business or and, and they're sitting on council as well at the same time, you know, their whole focus isn't necessarily on... Um, what's happening on that particular job. So, you, you know, be cognizant of that and, and brief them about the areas that you want to talk to them about. So it gives them a chance to get up to speed, you know. That's, that's the advice that I would give for, the, for local people. I think the only other thing I'd add to that is, you know, in a climate where there's less and less local news being reported, particularly in regions, even some suburbs, um, reporting on local councils and what your local councils are doing in an election and outside an election cycle is becoming more and more critical. And the more that the community radio sector can do that, um, the better our democracy will be. And there's a lot of studies that show yeah. there's no local reporting happening on local councils. That's actually where democracy suffers. Um, so I think sometimes people think, oh, it's just small fry, it's just local council, but it's actually really important to the cohesiveness of our communities. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, it's not small fry. And uh, in New South Wales, I know, with some of these council amalgamations, um, the answerability of the council has moved much further away from people who are paying rates um, and wanting some sort of decent administration. So I agree absolutely that, you know, it's really critical that community radio is covering their local councils. Yeah, it's also just from a story perspective, um, as much as it can kind of, yeah, seem small, massive corruption stories come out of local councils yep. primarily because there is no one watching them um, or very few people watching them so I think that that's a really like you know a, a pretty massive opportunity for community radio stations that you know number one you should be covering your local councils in general but also it's an area that not that many big media organizations are covering anymore which means that you have access to potentially really big stories so yeah see it as an advantage. Mm. 
Um, Alana Gray from 4AB has a, has a question. I might just ask for a bit more detail from you, Alana, um, before I can pose that one, if that's okay. Um, we've got a couple of questions from East Side 89.7. Well, are there any people here putting their hands up? Um, we've got Maisie and we've got Gemma, but Maisie asks... Um, there's a lot happening here politically, that's why. It might have something to do with it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> all the multiple elections. Um, politicians have, we've sort of touched on this one a little bit already, but if there's any additional advice you want to give Maisie, politicians have had media, media training and use interviews to get over their key points. How do you get around beneath or over this? Um, I think, and look, I think it's it's something that, that we all struggle with. You know, I interview politicians a lot and uh, it is a constant struggle. Um, I think the thing that I try and remember, at least for myself, is that it's okay to interrupt them. Um, again, do it, you know, with respect. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes they can just get on these roles and particularly if you're doing a live interview you know they'll talk for minutes and talk your head off right which is honestly just boring for your for your listeners um particularly when they're just talking about you know their own political points um so it's okay to interrupt them um and i think the other thing as well is that i find really helpful is um know your questions really well know what you want to get out of an interview and just actively listen through the interview. I know that um, interviewing politicians can sometimes feel um, quite intimidating. Um, they are very good at wiggling around questions. Um, but I think when you're ac actively listening to an interview, you can tell when they're going off on a tangent. Um, you know, and again, you can be polite about it. You can, you know, say, you know, um, so, you know, like just to bring you back to the point or, you know, repeat the question. Um, sometimes as well, it's good to uh, narrow the question. I know Sharon said that um, it's usually good to kind of keep them open ended. That's true. But if you're trying to get a specific answer from someone, sometimes narrowing it into a yes or no answer and, and saying that, saying, you know, minister, it was a yes or no question, you know, do you whatever, um, then that can be quite helpful. Thank you. And just um, Gemma from Eastside's asked, as a submetro station, any tips on getting big name but local politicians to engage with our station? I might say, Gemma, feel free, and this offer goes to anyone on the call. If you want to contact me, I'll put my contact details up at the end. More than happy to help look at any fact sheets you might have or help you develop one with different info and research about your station. So um, more than happy to chat offline about that. Um, Vivian Langford from 3CR, producer of the Climate Action Show. Uh, the focus is on net zero emissions. How can I focus MPs on our exported coal gas as Australia's challenge? Just the, just the easy questions for today. <laughs> um, well, I mean, you can ask them specific questions about it, um, I think. Uh, again, I think the other thing as well is that um, a lot of politicians have kind of side interests um a lot of them are interested in climate change policy or energy policy or exports or regional communities um you know that all all of those sort of areas kind of feed into um exports i guess um so i mean yeah potentially just like widening your your field um doing the research beforehand and seeing you know if you're um maybe not getting the politicians that you want um widening the scope a bit to try and get different politicians on on board or you know the other thing as well is if you're, spe if you're specifically looking at like coal exports look at where the seats are that do the most coal exports um and call those local politicians um that sort of thing or you know um on the flip side you can and from the, your show name climate action it pro I can presume what um angle you're taking but it's always good to sort of have the other the other side um and you know it's saying that coal exports you know if they do stop or slow down that um you know it, it is going to impact those those communities and what what are the solutions I think that's a really interesting point Amanda solutions there's a ph phenomenal book I read called solutions journalism which um really looks at presenting the issues, but also finding the solutions. And I think if you present, and this maybe is a webinar for another time, but um, 
you know, if you present some of these really complex challenges, uh, people can feel really dissuaded or un unhopeful. And so being like, well, this might be a challenge, but here are some people that are working in this space to find solutions. Anyway, so as a bit of an aside, I've um, got a couple of questions. So I'm going to keep going because we're going to do it five more minutes. Um, we've got Stella Glory from Vision Australia Radio. She asks, our community of interest is national and people who are blind or have low vision. Our aim is to speak with a rep from major parties plus maybe an independent if we interview greens for example would we then say to the libs the greens say that they would make online voting a priority for example like would you be really specific to get a, another candidate on board by saying well this person said this and we'd really like to know your your view yeah yeah why not um I'm, i mean I, as we were talking before oh you mean in the she's i think she's just said in the interview i mean yeah i think if you are factually correct and um that you can put other parties policies in the interview um and you know how are you responding to this i think that's absolutely fine i mean that's that's a really important point of the interview the greens are offering us this what would you offer us you know how do you feel about that offer? Um, you know, it, it, there's no problem with that at all. I think that's good that you can offer alternative policies. The other thing as well that I have found quite interesting in, um, and I don't know if this necessarily goes for the seat that you're in, the electorate that you're in, but um, the Greens in some areas have a massive voting block. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, if you're in a seat that, you know, has one of those like, 15% or 20% or more um, people who are voting Greens. I think that that makes it even more legitimate, but obviously that depends on um, the area that you're in. Mm. Yeah, it's a great point. I think it just goes back to like doing your research and your seat. What are the margins? What are the key points? What are people going to feel like talking about or where the pressure points are? Um, and the same extends to community radio. You know, you can say, oh, well, the Labor's party, uh, Labor has supportive uh, policy positions on community radio haven't committed to a dollar figure but what is your party going to commit um, that's another way a couple more questions from Craig there's a few in here Craig right so I'm going to see if I can unpick them one by one can you speak to the challenges of being apolitical our area is heavy with opposition candidates so their task to respond is easy enough but if we give the government rep an opportunity and they decline, is that still okay to put forward one side's view sort of exclusively? I think um, that sort of goes to the rules around offering free um, equal preference to different parties in the lead up to an election. You're totally right, Craig. All you can do is try to get people on. Yeah. I also, I also think it's really important to tell your audience that you've tried to get the other side on, and unfortunately, they haven't been available. Definitely. Um, I mean, you, you know, it, you need your audience to know that you're actually trying to get alternative opinions to, the, you know, to what, what you've put on air as well. So yeah. that they don't think that you're only ever interviewing one side or the other. Yeah, and you see it across the board for media publications, you know, we tried to get in contact with the, you know, the government minister and they declined an interview or they weren't available in the time frame, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, th I honestly, I think that's actually a really important part of any kind of political reporting that you say that you at least tried. Yeah. I mean, you'll see it on the 7.30 report at the moment. They make, they make a point of it nearly every time. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they do it on purpose. They've, they've got a concerted <laughs> campaign. <laughs> and I think we've got time for one of Craig's, um, one of the last Questions from Craig. What about facilitating a roundtable discussion? Um, can community radio do those effectively or does that stifle discussion on a topic? I've definitely seen a lot of stations do it with particularly local council elections or yeah, MP or people contesting a particular election. Um, there was a few comments of people saying that um, it works quite well mm. for them. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that kind of roundtable approach. I think my first thought on that is... Um... Get, getting your tech right <laughs> um, is, you know, you're going to have a lot of people 
people trying to talk at the at the same time um, and just like getting all your microphones in order, that sort of thing. It was probably my number one thought. But also that you really have to have a good mediator. So whoever is conducting the roundtable has to be really confident in interrupting people um, and having a very specific aim of what they actually want from the round table yeah. um, and making sure that that actually happens and bringing people back and so that it doesn't just turn into this kind of gab fest between a bunch of politicians. Yeah, I absolutely agree on that. The mediator is critical and and knowing your topic, the, the mediator knowing the topic is really critical as well and knowing what each person can bring to the table. Great points. Thank you both so much um, for that, today's webinar. Really appreciate it. And I think the audience has too. There's been some lovely comments to you both for sharing your insights today. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, our next webinar is coming up next month. We'll be announcing that this week. So you get sneak peek, but it's called Renewing Your Station's License. Uh, the ACMA has a new B66 form. So this is predominantly for stations that have a license renewal due October 2020, uh, sorry, a license expiring October 2022 or later. Um, so essentially you probably haven't started your re review process yet, but we'll need to do so. There's a new B66 form coming out this month. It's awesome. Um, I'm going to be running it again. I've been roped into it. So I hope you're not sick of me by now, but I'll also be joined by the ACMA, probably Hugh Clappen and maybe one of his upsiders. So we'll send out some information about that in due course. If you'd like some really hardcore regulation, we'll make it interesting, I promise. And um, there are my contact details. If you have any questions that weren't covered today, please don't hesitate to contact me directly and I will either answer them myself or pass to one of our experts. Um, if you have any questions about sort of your political strategy in the lead up to the election, you wanna get some more information about the CWA's policy positioning. If you want tips about, yeah, putting any of those fact sheets together, getting data on your station, um, you want to find out about some politicians, you know, I've got a pretty good uh, robust connection book of things and I can share more stories or something. Anyway, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and, and I might just add that CMTO does a very good interviewing course. Uh, I think it's a five week course. Um, you can contact Michaela for that, Michaela Ford, if you want to know more about that. But in the meantime, Happy interviewing. Thanks, Thanks Sharon. Yes, there's a link Thanks, everyone. in the um, Slack and I'll pop the link to the CMTO's upskilling community journalists across Australia on this webinar page. You can find it really easily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.